it is an ironclad guarantee that um, no person uh, in America will, uh, will be poor. Um, now, whether we want people to be not just poor, but productive, happy, and so forth, this we will ad uh, address to one another in our capacity as neighbors, as community members, as family members, but not as citizens through the agency of the federal government. <laughs>
first uh, laid out in just a couple of pages by Milton Friedman in Capitalism and Freedom, mm -hmm. in a book published in 1962, I think. Um, and <clears throat> it was, um, it sort of informed the debate, <clears throat> excuse me, in um, mm, about 1970, um, when uh, President Nixon proposed a family assistance uh, program that ultimately was not approved by Congress. And the concept is revived by uh, uh, Charles Murray in a book in 2005 called In Our Hands. Mm -hmm. um, that, uh, and Murray's um, uh, version of it is, is a good deal more um, uh, uh, detailed. Worked than, out than yes. Friedman. Uh, and he makes clear that, um, it, here's his argument. He said, the, the best case is to do away with the welfare state period. But it's clear that no advanced industrial society has ever not had a welfare state. Um, that option doesn't really seem to be on the menu. So um, the second best result is to have a welfare state that does the least harm to the maintenance of self-government and to the, um, to the beneficiaries. So Murray would. Um, do away with just about every one of those programs that is included in the human resources mm -hmm. part of the federal budget we were talking about. Even the big ones, Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid, federal aid to education. He, he provides an appendix that lists like 98, <laughs> everything, and replaces all of it with a, uh, a straightforward um, um, grant, um, $10,000 per adult. Um, um, and that, uh, that begins to diminish after people earn a certain threshold, but never disappears entirely. For people in the upper ends of the income distribution, it really amounts to a, a tax uh, uh, reduction. Right. Yeah. right. And his argument is that um, this will be cheaper than what we're doing, um, that uh, since, since the government has pretty much abandoned the idea of moral uplift and character improvement anyway. Um, this simply sort of codifies what's going on. Right. And then it, 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 it is an ironclad guarantee that um, no person uh, in America will, uh, will be poor. Um, now, whether we want people to be not just poor, but productive, happy, and so forth, this we will uh, address to one another in our capacity as neighbors, as community members, as family members, but not as citizens through the agency of the federal government. I don't think it's a perfect solution, but I think it's an intriguing idea mm -hmm. as a, um, and, and also I don't think if there's any imminent danger that it's going to be enacted, <laughs> <laughs> which gives us more latitude yes, in a sense yes. to, to advocate, but I, but I think it's, it's an excellent sort of um, um, standpoint for arguing the question. Um, since, uh, since the liberal project seems to be endless, and since it seems to be um, not only weirdly detached from the question of whether it does any good to the beneficiaries, but also um, uh, casually detached from the, the question of the costs imposed on it. Mm -hmm. I mean, uh, going back to the early 90s, Irving Kristol was talking about a conservative welfare state. Um, what a conservative welfare state would be is hard to define. Mm -hmm. uh, he did not spell it out in very great detail. But one way to describe a conservative welfare state is that it would be the welfare state that was to for forced to operate on a budget equal to what liberals have prepared Americans to actually spend on the welfare state. Um, if you funded the welfare state in terms of the taxes that liberals have forthrightly endorsed, you would have a very lean welfare state. No deficit yeah. spending. Yeah. And, and, and Murray thinks, and you think, that, uh, just to, just to uh, reiterate this point, mm -hmm. that um, the effect of a negative income tax, which is just a check, the government sends you a check. And that's right. Um, there are no social workers, there are no, you know, there's no, no, nothing else. Um, would be to revive civil society. I mean, you would have a kind of uh, flourishing of private s charity and private compassion. In a way, you're privatizing compassion t to the extent yeah. that churches and you know uh, 
civil associations of various kinds mm -hmm. will, will spring up to help people and to and to integrate people. Yeah. Um, not, not just uh, compassion, which which involves, as you say, this hierarchy of empathize er and empathize right. but also uh, that it would um, uh, revive, uh, strengthen uh, what Tocqueville uh, saw as, as the the power of, of associations right. coming together. So, for example. Uh, when there's no longer uh, Medicare, but you're getting this uh, stipend from the government, you need to find a way to um, provide for your um, uh, health care needs when you're an old person. Mm -hmm. Well, um, if you revive the kinds of civil associations that offered mm -hmm. um, annuities and health insurance policies and sort of vetted them to make sure that they were actually beneficial for their members, then you not only address the uh, uh, sort of uh, programmatic and budgetary need, but a a, an important collateral effect is that you get people working with one another uh, rather than sort of outsourcing their compassion and their neighborliness and their engagement with their fellow citizens through the Federal Welfare Office, through the Department of Health and Human Services. And there will still be people who presumably will take the check straight to Atlantic City. Mm -hmm. um, or to the neighborhood's uh, liquor store or whatever. Yes. Um, but the solution to that, in your view, is not uh, government compassion in the sense of the welfare state as we know it, but um, the private sector in some way, or the civil society yes. in its, uh, in its uh, variety and in its many ramifications. Yes, traditional morality um was as strong as it was for as long as it was, uh, not because I suspect people were necessarily better or more moral, mm -hmm. but that departing from it had very severe consequences. Um, we're going to agree in this prosperous society under Charles Murray's plan that we'll make those consequences a little less severe, but we are not saying that we're going to protect you from all the consequences of your bad decisions. Mm -hmm. Um, if you take your stipend um, to the casino or to the liquor store, you're going to have a miserable life. And that's... Might have a pretty good couple of days. You but might have, I mean, yeah. but, but after that, the hangover, <laughs> bad deal. Um, but we're saying that as citizens relating to other citizens, that's not our problem. As members of society, as members of a church, we can choose to make it our problem, mm -hmm. but not further. And is that, uh, would that be a practical working out, the negative income tax, would it be a practical working out of self-interest rightly understood, or is it something more than that, mm -hmm. or different from that? Well, I think, I, I think it's a plausible way of characterizing uh -huh. self-interest rightly understood. Um, it, uh, there may be more plausible ones. I mean, um, I'm... Uh, I, I go a long way, but not completely down the road to sort of saying this is what we ought to do. What, what I like about it is that uh, it, it, it resembles a plan that um, uh, William Buckley offered in his mm -hmm. book, uh, 1970, I think, Four Reforms, Four Reforms yes, yeah. that, um, that also wanted to sort of clear the deck to a great deal. Uh, what, what, what Buckley's idea was uh, would be that the federal government would um, confine its welfare state programs to people living in those states with an income below right. the national median. Right. Um, and the more prosperous states would then take care of their problems internally. Right. Um, I, I think the, the, the uh, political idea is that, um, to borrow a, a phrase from Buckley, that uh, liberalism operates by blackening the sky with crisscrossing dollars. It does this for a reason. Um, it encourages the uh, illogical <laughs> impossibility, yeah. really, that yeah. if the government rearranges enough money among enough people, somehow everybody can come out as a net importer of these redistributed dollars. Um, what what uh, both, I think, Buckley and Friedman, Murray are all doing is saying, if you simplify things, if you make it clearer who's giving and who's taking, then you, 
the, the sort of the natural uh, conservatism, mm -hmm. the sense that, that you're not giving away a free good, will revive itself politically and will condition the debate in a way that is, um, conservatizes the, the whole project. Um, so I would, uh, uh, any sort of a workable scheme that, that makes the welfare state less complicated, I think also works toward making it um, more disciplined and more restrained in a way. Um, Paul Ryan has recently proposed um, and this is something conservatives uh, come up with uh, every few years um, um, uh, <laughs> of, of consolidating a number of federal programs and making block grants right. to states and localities. It has the same effect. It, um, it, it simplifies the process. It cut, uh, chops away at the idea that um, uh, it's possible to have everybody come out ahead of a redistributive endeavor. And it, it by re-engaging state and local government in the process of actually figuring out what to do with this money, it re-engages citizens in government closer to home rather than right. the one that's distant. Thank you, William Vogeli, author of uh, The Pity Party, a, a BS-free tome now available at uh, the bookstores near you. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Mm -hmm.